Okay. Uh, what I'll do then is I will uh, get started. Um, and maybe what I'll do is I know Shirley wanted to speak a little bit to the program and maybe I'll let her go at the very end, uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, so for those who joined us, thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to ask that all of you mute yourselves if you can. Um, and what will happen is Vicky's going to be taking questions from the chat. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, if you have uh, a question you think is too complicated to ask in chat, just hit the raise hand icon in chat and I'll unmute you and I'll give you a chance to ask your question. Um, my name is Chris Schultz. I'm from a company in Seattle called Robot Mesh. Uh, we are a VEX robotics distributor on the West Coast. So we serve Washington, Idaho, California, and Oregon. Um, and basically what we do is we're just one stop shopping for robots. Uh, so we uh, sell the robotic hardware. We have a programming environment uh, for it. We support teams that are interested in robotics competitions and teachers like yourself who wanna get started with teaching programming using VEX robot kits. Uh, in the last three years, we've partnered with Catapult Robotics to develop a robotics workshop in a can, uh, so to speak. And so what I'm gonna be going through with the group is I'll be taking you through the packages that most of you are waiting to receive, talk about what's in them, and then we'll go through two short lessons involving the robot. And I'll just talk about the steps involved with programming it. Uh, so in a second here, I'm gonna share my screen and Let's do this. So it should be the case that you guys are looking at a OneNote file. I just want to kind of, uh, this is kind of a rough agenda that I've built for today. We're going to be talking in this session about the learning materials, the contents that come in the kit. We're going to be talking about some um, maintenance tips for ensuring that your robotics workshop runs smoothly. Uh, we'll actually talk about how to build the robot. And then we'll discuss the two means of programming it, uh, which is using the uh, controller. All of these robot kits come with what looks like a, uh, a joystick video game type controller. And uh, you can also program the robot autonomously using Google Blockly. Uh, so you're gonna see me throughout the session switch back and forth with screen sharing. So just give me a second here to move on to my next display here, this one. So is it the case, Vicky, that you can see uh, what looks like a VEX IQ tub? Absolutely. Excellent. So uh, I know a lot of you are waiting for your kits. What's going to happen in the next couple of days is you're going to receive uh, some boxes. And inside of that box is going to be um, a bunch of um, plastic construction pieces for the VEX IQ robot. And it will come in a plastic container. It looks like this. Uh, has a number of what I call very Lego-y looking pieces, although it's not called Lego, but essentially um, the robot system is using a pin and hole construction system. And then what we see here at the top are the various sensors and peripheral devices, which we'll be um, taking a look, better look at in a few minutes. In addition to this kit, there's going to be some um, getting started documents to help you uh, get through the course. And so one of those documents is going to be a getting started guide. It's going to uh, tell you about the hardware that has been shipped to you. So in this case, there's going to be a robot in there. Uh, there's going to be a Chromebook that's paired with the robot. And uh, there's going to be some posters that accompany it. And depending on the number of kits you have coming to you, you may wind up with multiple robot and uh, Chromebook pairs. So this very first document is basically what you're going to see when you first open the box. It's going to explain um, what's the contents of the kit as well as the kit return instructions. Um, so this program is using um, loaned kits or refurbished kits. So what's happening is we send a kit to you. When you're finished with it, you send it back to us. We refurbish it, and then we send it back out to the next uh, school in the Catapult program. Uh, inside of the kits, there's going to be uh, FedEx labels, so you will not want to lose those. So when you're done, you'll just take the FedEx label, tape it to the box, send it back to FedEx, and uh, we'll uh, sort through it in Seattle. Some of the kits that you guys will have will be brand, brand new um, kits. Um, and there's always a question about should you keep the original packaging? I will tell the group that the original packaging is the very first thing that gets discarded, right? So if you think of this as like Christmas Day, everyone's very excited to open the robot and unbox it. And if you can keep the packaging, that's great. Uh, we certainly don't expect it. And usually by the second session, it's completely gone. Uh, the things that, that I want you to keep is do you keep the, the tray that comes with the, the box because that's super useful for sorting the uh, 
um, elements that come with it. You'll also find in this document that there's a Chromebook. Uh, the Chromebook will have instructions for how, where to charge it, how to connect it, how to power it on. The Chromebook will already have the application, the programming environment pre-installed um, on the uh, Chromebook, so you won't have to install anything. This program uh, is designed to run offline, so everything you need should work without an internet connection. Um, and what we'll see in a couple minutes here is the actual Robot Mesh Studio software. The last kind of final bit of housekeeping uh, tips here is that you'll find inside of the uh, VEX kit that there is a um, charging, uh, a charging base and a battery, a lithium battery. You'll want to make sure that you have that battery charged. It's very difficult to run a robotics program without a charged battery. Um, so what I tell people usually is to get in the habit of just letting that charge overnight so that when you come to do your class the next day, everything's waiting for you. Uh, there's also, uh, as we'll soon see, um, a, uh, a game controller that comes with the robot. So students can drive the robot as like an RC car. Um, the controller, the game controller is paired to the robot. So I ask um, that uh, you do not mix and match kits. Sometimes it's very common that when you have multiple kids building together, uh, that some of the students will say, hey, you know, if you're not using that part, do you mind if I use it in my robot? Uh, for your sanity and for mine, the answer to that question should always be no. Uh, everything you need to get through the program is in that individual kit, including the paired controller uh, and the Chromebook that is mapped to the robot. So um, usually it's just a good habit to uh, keep robot kits separated from each other. Uh, we'll see when we take a look in the box in a minute uh, that there are colored bits. So if you have multiple robot kits in your class, you're going to see that some of the kits have pink pieces, some have red pieces, some have yellow, orange, blue pieces. And the idea here is you can uh, um, assign each robot an identity, so to speak, uh, and color code it. So usually when I teach this robotics workshop, I have a team red, a team green, a team blue, and so on. And it's their job to keep their robot together, charged, and isolated from the other kits. Um, so all of everything I just explained to you is in this uh, document. It's just basically your, your maintenance tips. You will also have, uh, in addition to this uh, uh, brief getting started document, you will get a student uh, workbook. So the student workbook, uh, each of these exercises uh, that we're about to go to is going to have a, a, a journaling aspect to it where the students are encouraged to um, think about the engineering design process, which Shirley will speak to at the end of this workshop and to catalog their thoughts. And so this is an example student workbook. You can see the unit number and the theme in these two gears. And then there's usually some um, learning objectives here up front. So it tells you here that for this chapter, there's these two particular lessons, getting the robot built, getting the robot to play a simple game using the game controller. And then there's some student um, handouts here just to remind them about the engineering design process and some of the takeaways, for example, this idea Usually the lessons start off with a brief discussion about, um, you know, what is a robot or what is a sensor? How do you guys think this will work? And so um, those takeaways will be here. And then the remainder of the book is really just a daily log. So students here can talk about, uh, chronicle their journal, their learning experience. And we just see lots of pages of uh, log sheets. And at the back here, if there was a sample program that they were going to build, um, there may be finished code here at the very end of that document. So if they were looking for a reference, uh, here it is. These uh, code solutions also exist in the software. When we get into the programming environment uh, later in this session, I'll show you where those live. And so I, that's pretty much all there is to the student guide. And uh, closely affiliated with the student guide is the teacher learning manual. So it's going to look very simple. The teacher's guide is going to look very similar. Uh, again, we have the unit number, the theme. Uh, there's two flavors of this uh, course. There's an elementary school flavor and an intermediate aged flavor. And um, I think Vicky might be able to help me a little bit with this, but I think the intermediate flavors like grades is sixth grade and up. And then before that, I think it's using the elementary. Um, the lessons in both the elementary and the intermediate um, uh, programs are very, very similar. 
um, and there's a lot of overlap. Uh, the key difference is that the intermediate lessons have more uh, programming exercises attached to them. But I think in this particular example, I happen to be using the intermediate lesson, uh, but chapter seven or unit seven for the elementary will look very similar. So here we are in the teacher's guide. Again, there's just a brief index, what's in here. And then the lessons are split out into um, uh, different, approximately one hour sessions. The sessions are designed um, to get, if you have about 45 to 60 minutes, that, yeah, that would be um, ideal. In some of the cases, you may need more time and that's not a problem, right? So um, there's always a little bit of um, setup time with kids coming into class and unpacking the robot and then at the end of the day with them having to clean up and, and getting ready for their next class. Uh, so if you wind up um, crossing over and needing more time for a session, that's not a problem. This is just a suggested outline. Um, and like I said, the lessons are roughly 60 minutes in length. We'll see here that there's different uh, assessment uh, criteria for the lessons in terms of things that uh, class should be taking away from each project. And um, there's different uh, suggestions here for group routines and timing. Um, Shirley will speak more to um, the logistics of running the class at the end of the session. Um, and then all of these lessons start off with a uh, brief description of what we're about to cover. So in this particular case, this is one of the first chapters in the intermediate section. Uh, so it's gonna identify what it is we're doing the different uh, components. So in this case, you're gonna have a robot kit that has 800 structural components, uh, four motors, seven sensors, a brain, and then it's reminding you of the documentation, which we'll see in a little bit that comes with this class. Um, there's different um, curriculum mappings. I think this one's using common core standards just to show you how the different sessions touch on, uh, the, compute, on the different computer science frameworks for uh, common core. And, then we will get into our first session uh, a little later on. Uh, so uh, suspend disbelief for a moment. We will come back to this in greater detail. I just wanted to introduce the teacher's guide um, at this uh, point in time. Uh, now, while I am here, this is a good place to stop just to see if there are any questions from the group before I introduce the rest of the documents. I would encourage you all just to raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted. Um, or if you have asked a question in the chat for uh, Vicky to just read uh, your question to me. Any questions? So there were a couple of questions in the chat. I did address them there. Uh, let me go back because there were a few. Um, one I did not address and that is um, Norman had asked about micro mouse competition. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Um, I didn't know the answer. Sure. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I, I do not know I've, I've done several different types of robotics competitions, but micro mouse isn't one of them. Um, so these kits, there is a, uh, a VEX competition, which runs globally that so, and the good news is that the programming that you're gonna be doing for this robot is tournament legal for the larger VEX competition. Um, if you have, I'm gonna provide an email address at the end of this session. So Norman, if you had specific questions about things you're looking at, I have experience with uh, Lego Robotics, with World Robot Olympiad, and with VEX, but Micro Mouse will be new to me. So if you wanna chat with me after, we can do, certainly do that. Um, any other things that I've missed in the first couple of documents that we've covered? It should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, there were some questions about the, um, the snap together pieces, um, but I know you're gonna go over that more in detail. Um, yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. The manual that you showed are print materials that will be coming. So I know some people have received their robot kits, but you have not received that teacher lesson manual or teacher's guide. Never fear, it will be on its way. It should arrive with all of your other printed materials. And if you don't see it when you get like your reading teacher lesson manual, then reach out directly to your supervisor. Okay, uh, I'm going to go back and cover the remainder of the documents and then we'll talk about robot construction, which I know is what you're all really interested in hearing. Uh, so give me a second here just to finish out this section of the demonstration. So we've talked about the teacher's guide, we will come back to it. Um, it should be the case, and I think Vicky can help me here, you guys can see a sumo ring here on the screen. 
and Vicky may be muted yep. if I don't. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sorry, I was giving nope. you a thumbs up. I guess. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, no, it's um, when I go into the screen share, I lose sight of the, the group and including the chat. Um, so the objective in this workshop, if and, and it's not something you have to do, but each of the lessons in the teacher guide builds towards a robotic sumo competition. Um, I'm going to temporarily stop sharing the screen so I can share with you um, what the sumo mat actually looks like. So one of the items you are going to receive in your box is going to be a paper sumo ring. And this is kind of half folded. It's a little it becomes really big when it's fully extended. And the idea here is that each of the lessons in the workshop builds up to a, a robotics competition. So what's going to happen here is we will build a base robot from the instructions provided. So we talked about the building instructions, and I'll be going back to them in a couple of minutes. And this robot is going to be really difficult to see on my uh, webcam but it has a number of sensors. So over the course of, I think there's roughly a dozen lessons in the workshop, um, you're gonna learn to basically program a robot to do battle with another robot in the sumo ring and the rules to sumo as well as this mat are also included in the challenge. It's a lot of fun. Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years and kids never get bored of sumo and I never get bored of sumo and much, many tears have been shed in that time. Um, also very interesting to watch how girls and boys play. When boys play sumo, there's winners and there are losers. You do not want to be a loser. Um, the girls tend to be a little more collaborative and, and friendly, uh, but some. But I've seen some really amazing robot builds and um, competitions uh, from both groups. So you'll have this sumo mat uh, with instructions for playing sumo. Um, let me go back to my uh, screen share. You will also have the robot build instructions. Now, I think Vicky here, who I cannot see her thumbs up, is going to say, yes, I can see your Vex IQ robot build instructions. Is that the case? Yes, Vicky? I can, Chris. You're good. Okay. okay, awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the instructions uh, for building the robot. Um, it's worth mentioning that although there's um, two robot builds we'll be taking you through, if I type in Vex IQ uh, build uh, instructions, I should have had this screen ahead of time, so my apologies. Uh, but there's actually about a dozen different robots you can build from that kit. So what I said earlier, that there's really no good reason to share your um, hardware with another team, I meant it. <laughs> so everything in that one box can build all of these robots, plus the robot I'm going to show you, plus whatever you can um, imagine. So give me a second to go back to my robot. So some helpful tips. Um, the robots we're going to be using for this course is this driving base. And so it's step one, standard drive base. And we're going to be using step number four, the autopilot with instructions. Um, you're welcome to build these other robots. We're just none of the lessons use them at all. Um, so this is eventually going to become our sumo bot. On the next page, there's some, uh, in, some helpful hints for working with the pieces. As I mentioned, it's a pin and a whole construction system. Um, so sometimes if you have small hands, um, then there's some uh, tips here for being able to use the building elements to either insert or push out uh, the different pins. Um, I happen to have big hockey goalie mitts for hands and I'm usually the first person people ask when they need a jar open. So um, I've never had to use this sheet, but I'm just showing you that there are some suggestions here about things you can do if you find that the pieces are um, a little rigid and for some of the newer kits it could be that the plastic is uh, rigid because the box has never been used before so let's take a look at the first um, instructions this is this is the very next page it's for our standard driving base i'm going to make this a little bit bigger um, so we can read what's going on so as i said it's just pin and holes um, snaps together um, there's some things that i will draw your attention to by way of helpful hints um, you will notice that each of these pieces has a part a parts ID. We'll be talking about that parts ID in a couple of minutes. And in most cases, I think in the instruction guide, these are actually one-to-one -one instructions. So I'll show you in a moment our robot building poster. But if you're not sure what piece you're to use, you can actually take the element and lay it on over this graphic. And in most cases, it should be one-to-one. 
the metal axles are interesting. Um, they can often be a, an, an element that is hard um, to get right in terms of grabbing the right axle. Some helpful hints here is next to the serial number for the metal axle, we see this 4XP. What that's telling you is that this axle is four holes in pitch long, meaning that if I were to take the axle and line it up against um, one of these um, plates here, in this case, this is like a 12 hole plate, we should find that the axle is about four holes in length approximately. Um, and a, a, a way to demonstrate that quite easily is again, if I go out of my screen share here, I have an axle just to show you. So this is gonna be hard to see, but this is one of the metal axles. I have a building plate. And my guess is that this is a 6P six, six axle, although I haven't verified that on the instructions. And what we can see here is if we count, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Now there is an easier way than guessing, although guessing is fun. Um, inside of your kit, there's also going to be a building poster. And this is maybe the most useful poster in the whole box. So what this poster does is it gives a one-to-one -one parts diagrams of all the pieces. And so if I was not sure if I had the right piece, I'm just gonna make this a little smaller so I can demonstrate this. So for example, if I didn't know if I had the right piece, what I could do here is I can take this piece and match it to one of the diagrams. We should see that it just fits perfectly on the uh, on the poster. So usually what I'll do is I'll put this poster at the front of the class, just tape it to the whiteboard or the chalkboard, whatever have you. And then the kids as they're building can come up, see if they have the right piece. What you cannot see maybe so easily on this poster is that each of these um, uh, pieces has that part ID. So remember there's a little serial number underneath each of the elements. So what you could do here is you could take the piece you think is the right piece, place it against the poster to see if it fits and then just reconfirm the serial number. Now, if you use the wrong piece, it's not the end of the world. Um, I've built with missing pieces and wrong pieces all of my career. Um, it just, the, everything works a little bit nicer when you do it by the book, but everything will still work if you use um, a slightly larger axle. So don't get stressed out about that. Um, there is also one last poster I will chat about, which I do not have on me, unfortunately. It is a Blockly poster. So you will see a similar poster uh, that has a list of programming commands uh, sorted by uh, their functionality that is also a classroom resource that very typically I would have taped uh, to the board. So that's it for the documents portion of this demo. Again, I will just see if there's any questions that have come up about any of the things that I've just um, shown you. Uh, Vicki, any questions that you can see that I've missed? Uh, hands up if you would like to verbally ask a question. Yeah, and I think you are good to go. There were there was a materials question, but that's an on the ground field question. So, okay, all right. Uh, so then, moving along, uh, then again, we'll just talk about fundamentals. This is my experience learned over many years the hard way. So I failed, so that you might all succeed. Um, in your box, you're going to find the charger, very important, and the battery for the robot, also very important. And the, the uh, charger just slides into the, the um, bay charging base, so it's pretty easy. Um, the other thing you may, depending on when you get the kit and how much it's been used, is this is the game controller uh, that comes with the robot. And at the uh, bottom of the controller here, there's a little micro USB cable. Inside of your box, you're going to have a black micro USB cable. I find here. And if this just charges, uh, connects one end to your uh, game controller and the other end to the uh, uh, Chromebook or whatever computer you happen to be using. And um, periodically you may want to charge the controller. There's no way to remove the battery in here. It's an internal battery. So um, that's just another pro tip. I find that the battery in the joystick lasts a lot longer than the battery in the robot because the joystick isn't doing any kind of mechanical motion. So it tends to last a little bit longer. but if you get this kit late and the joystick's not working, it may be that you need to charge it. Um, other things we can chat. So let me keep moving here. Um, let's talk about the uh, coding environment uh, for driving the robot. So I'm going to, uh, again, 
I'm going to again uh, go into a screen share. Yeah, we use a tool, a little sage. A little sage. We use little sage. A little sage. Okay. Participants could stay on mute while Chris is chatting us through. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so let's go to the programming environment. So I'm, I happen to be using a Chromebook. Um, so here, what we'll find is on the uh, Chromebook, you'll have either uh, the app should be pinned to the taskbar. If it isn't, you can also find it from the launcher here on the left-hand side. And I happen to have it down here, Robot Mesh Studio app. Uh, Vicky, for my benefit, is there, uh, are you able to see the app? You've got it. Okay, excellent. So we'll just talk a little bit about what's happening in here. Um, on the left-hand side are gonna be the projects that you and your students create. Uh, you can create as many as you like um, and the projects auto save. So as you are building the, the code, there's no file save button. It will just periodically every couple of seconds uh, save the file. On the right-hand side, these are the solution sets uh, for the various exercises. So if we come back to um, our teacher's guide, let's take a look at this here is it's gonna have a bunch of questions for you to ask your class along with a range of uh, responses that you might receive from your students. And then in this particular lesson, they're building the robots. Let's go a little further here. Usually it's gonna be the case somewhere in here that um, it's gonna tell you where to, what, what, what code to run. And, and so what the code it's referring to, and I can't find it exactly at the moment here in this document, is referring to the, um, these, these are the solution sets. Now there's three ways you can uh, control the robot. The robot out of the box works with the game controller, which I will demonstrate in a second. Um, there's also, um, you can manually customize the controller. So you can imagine if you built one of the more complicated builds, say the robot has an arm and a claw, so on and so forth. You could use the buttons on the controller to map different macros or different program functionality to each button. And then lastly, you can run completely autonomous programs. I'm gonna start off first with just showing you the inbox um, functionality. So excuse me while I stop sharing here. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So I have my completed robot and I have, I have my battery. Battery just slides into the bottom of the robot pretty easy. And I think I have a slide I can show you a little later on, but what we have essentially is we have four buttons on the robot brain. This is the robot's brain. We have a uh, check mark button. I'm just gonna make sure I'm grabbing the right button. The check mark, which is the on off button for the robot, it will turn the robot on. It's also like your enter button. So as you use the directional arrows to move through the menu on screen to make your selection, you'll hit the check mark. So when I press this, we'll hear the robot whistle and it will turn on. Now it's gonna be hard for you to see this screen because my monitor is very bright. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if I have a slide on pairing the, uh, on showing you what this display looks like. So just give me one second while I navigate to that screen. And then I'll show you how to drive um, the robot. So one moment here, I'll just let you talk amongst yourselves for 10 seconds here while I pull up uh, something new. So while you're doing that, Chris, I am going to address a question um, sure. that came up in the chat, and I did um, post a reply. Um, but just to just to clarify, so some of our uh, field operators refer to virtual robotics by the company name Robot Mesh, and then talk about in-person robotics as just robotics. Um, both are owned by Robot Mesh. It's just our way of designating which is which. So if you were confused. Um, that's common. We often confuse them, um, but just know that you are in the right place. If you have a robot kit or you are doing in-person robotics, um, this is exactly where you should be with our friend Chris here from Robot Mesh. And I, I can just add to that. Um, I think, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Vicki. Um, I just wanted to add, my name is Shirley, by the way, um, for those of you I don't know. Um, the So for whether you're using in-person or virtual robotics, the studio in which students work 
um, if you, you know, in the Chromebook, so Chris Schultz talked about the Chromebook, this, the studio in which students are learning how to code and write this language for the robots is the Robot Mesh Studio. And so you'll also see reference to the studio. When we say Robot Mesh Studio, that's what we mean. This is the interface, the, the virtual interface or the program on your students' Chromebooks where they will be writing the computer coding for the robots. So that's another um, language or another term that'll come up that sometimes people want to know more about. So thank you all. Awesome. Um, I'm going to just share my screen. I did find what I was looking for. So let's take, so um, just because it's hard to see my VEX IQ brain, what I wanted to show you is just some of the images from the documentation. So again, Vicky will just confirm, you can see this uh, clip art image of the VEX IQ brain, can you? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. So what we'll see is that the VEX IQ brain has a series of numbered ports, one through six, seven through 12 at the back. In the building instructions, so if I go a little bit further in this building guide to the end, just take a second here. The key part here is when you finish the build here, you'll see these check mark, uh, these checkered flags. And it's telling you, you now have built the driving base. And from this driving base, you can build the Clawbot, which is one of the other builds, or the autopilot robot, which is what we're gonna be using in the latter uh, sumo lessons. You can see here that again, um, the various peripheral um, devices, motors, sensors, whatnot, are connected from the peripheral device or the motor um, to the uh, different ports on the VEX IQ brain. So in this particular instance here, it's telling you to connect the motors to port six and to port one. Um, this solution set, so the exercises in the in Robot Mesh Studio that are finished examples, are uh, work on the basis that you have built and mapped the peripheral devices to the correct ports. So you can use other ports. If you wanted to say use ports five and two, that would be totally fine. It's just that the sample program wouldn't work. You would have to change the port mapping in Robot Mesh Studio. And we'll discuss how to do that in uh, a little later on. The other thing that's useful here is that there's some uh, cable length suggestions. So again, here for these two motors, it's telling you to use the 200 millimeter length cable. Uh, again, on that one-to-one -one, um, poster that I showed you where we could take parts and put it on the poster, there's also diagrams of the various cables. And so you can actually take the cable, extend it across the poster and find out if you're using the right lengths. Um, generally speaking, the shorter cables are in the front, longer cables are in the back, just because to reach these back ports, we need the longer cable. Um, so once we have the robot all built and it's plugged into the correct ports, in this case, this is just using the two motors on six and one, then the next step here is to actually put the battery in and turn the robot brain on. So here we saw that there's a check mark, which is like our on button and our enter button. We press that. X button as our off button and our cancel button. And then we use the directional arrows to move through the menu. When you first turn the robot on before having uh, done any programming with it, what you're going to find is that you essentially have two options. You have uh, a programs list. Initially, there will not be any programs on the brain. Um, if you're getting the robot after it's been in use, there may be old student programs on the brain. Um, this little Wi-Fi, these Wi-Fi bars are telling you that the um, robot is paired to the controller. So if you're having trouble connecting uh, the game controller to the robot, this will be a, a good place to look. Um, and then we also have uh, the battery status. What I'm going to do, and then I'll come back to this, is I'm going to show you what to do in the odd event that the robot controller is not paired. Uh, to the robot. It does sometimes happen. We do. We make every effort when the kit leaves to make sure that everything is is working correctly. But you know, mistakes do happen. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a minute, and I'm going to come back to my robot and my game controller. So here's my game controller. Inside of the box, you're going to find what looks like a really fat-looking Ethernet cable. And so if for whatever reason, students have swapped um, controllers around or it's not working first, make sure the, the joystick is charged. Second, take a look at that, those, that Wi-Fi status symbol to see if you're connected. And if you're not connected, then you can reestablish the pairing between um, the, the game controller and the robot by taking this ethernet looking cable 
putting it into the back of the controller, it just snaps in. And then on the robot, we're gonna see that there's also an ethernet looking jack and we can just put it in here. We can turn the joystick on. So there's just a black button to turn the joystick on and it turns green. It's flashing right now because it's not, the robot isn't turned on. So let me turn on the robot. Robot whistles, it's coming on. And with these two buttons, uh, with, with this um, cable between the robot and the joystick, it just takes about a second or two for them to pair. And then what I can do is I can remove the uh, cable. And when I do that, the robot and the game controller will be paired. And if I'm not sure about that, I can, I can check the status symbol here. Sometimes you have to do it multiple times. I actually think in the progress, process of doing this, I may have accidentally unpaired my robot and, and game controller. So I'll come back to this in a minute, but that's essentially how you do it. Uh, let's go back here to the desktop. So what we'll do here is we can see on the uh, Vex IQ brain, again, we have uh, the option here to uh, do driver control. If I click on that driver control button, so I use the little check mark button to select it, I will be able to drive the robot using the joysticks, uh, the left and right joystick on that game controller, just as if it was a remote control car. Um, my robot, I need to repair my, um, my uh, controller robot mapping, so I won't demonstrate it, but take it on word here that uh, you can um, drive the robot just as, like, as a remote control car using this driver control option. Um, let's hang out here for a second just to see if there's questions about the pairing, and then I'll talk about the programming environment. We'll write some simple programs to make the robot move so you can see that. I'll just hang out here for a couple of uh, seconds here and see if anything has come into chat or if uh, you guys have your hands raised if there's anything you want to bring up. Uh, any questions so far? No? Lots of silence. Yep, we're good. Okay, awesome. So then let us continue with uh, the programming environment. Uh, so, okay. So I'm back here in the Robot Mesh Studio app. I just again launched it from the um, taskbar. And what we'll do here is I will take, I'll create a new local project. So let's just create a brand new project to discuss what the programming environment looks like. When you create a new project, uh, there'll be a little bit of configuration you have to do. Now, Robot Mesh Studio can be used to program uh, other robotic platforms in addition to the VexIQ robot. In this particular instance, um, Catapult Learning is using a custom version of the software, so your only choice is going to be VexIQ. So we see the picture of the Vex brain. That's our target environment. Our language choices are interesting. Um, so again, we can program, we can custom code uh, the buttons on the controller. We can program in Blockly, or we can program the robot in Python. Um, Blockly is a great place to start because not only is it easy, it uses English like commands, but it can also, we can see the generated Python code uh, from the Blockly block. So if you're looking to go further with this and ultimately teach Python, uh, there is a way to do that here in Robot Mesh Studio. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm just going to select Blockly as the programming environment. Under options here, it will recommend a goofy name. Sometimes your friendly mountain, sometimes your magical horse, uh, sometimes your whispering pine. But I find it it's much easier if you give your project a name that's meaningful to you. So I might call this like motor movement, just so that I know what this this program does, and I'll hit create. So we're now in the uh, Robot Mesh Studio programming environment. If you're looking at this on a Chromebook, the screen might be really small, so you may want to play with the setup. Each of these um, uh, windows can be maximized and minimized, so I can make it bigger. If I need to read it, I can make it smaller, and I can do that here as well. You might notice that there's a little hot button, so this button will uh, close and open those window panes. So if again, if I'm on the tiny little Chromebook screen, I might need all my screen space. So here I can click on these little hot buttons and maximize my space. I also have uh, a set of magnification tools that will make, make this 
much bigger. Um, if you happen to be, uh, we don't supply this, but if you happen to have a micro USB-C, as in Chris, micro USB-C to HDMI converter, it's very common to have teachers take their Chromebook, plug it into a smart board or screen and to make this big so that people can work along. That will depend, of course, on your, on your classroom setup. Um, so let's talk about these panes. I'm gonna bring them back. On the right hand side is our device manager. You might see the numbers here, one through 12. Recall that the VEX IQ brain has 12 numbered ports. And so when we connect the robot, uh, those um, motors and sensors will show up here on the right hand side. There's also uh, some additional options for mapping the joystick, uh, which we won't get into just yet. What I'd like to do here is we're gonna uh, take the robot and connect to the programming environment and we'll see what comes up. So um, although you cannot see me just yet, I'm grabbing the robot. I'll get out a screen share momentarily to show you what I'm doing. Uh, so let's come out of here. So I have my robot, which I'm going to turn on, hit the check mark, it's gonna whistle. I have my joystick turned on, which I will probably have to pair at some future point. And what I'm going to do is you will have, uh, as I mentioned, when we were talking about charging the uh, joystick, you'll have a little black uh, micro USB cable. So I will take that cable, put it in. So one end is in the robot. The other end is just your standard USB. It will go into your Chromebook. And in a second here, it's going to, I'm going to plug this into my computer if I can find an available port. Uh, so give me one moment to do that. Well, it's always tricky because I never have enough ports. Let's do this. One moment while I uh, reach behind my computer. Excuse me. Okay. So I'm now plugged into my computer cable. And now let's do, let's hope that some coding magic uh, occurs. So let's go back into my screen share desktop. Okay, so the robot is turned on, it's plugged into the computer. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to click this detect sensors button. You see how when I clicked on detect sensors, it all lit up. This robot happens to be in the finished state with its various bumpers and motors connected. What we can do if we want to test everything out before programming it, is I can click on this connect button. And I can begin moving these sliders. So I'm going to get out a screen share in a moment. But what I'm doing is I'm making actually my one motor spin. This robot has bumpers at the back. So as I press them on and off, they light up. I'm just going to end my screen share so you can see what the robot's doing. So you can see that I have the motor spinning on one side. I'm going to come back. Uh, and I can I can uh, disconnect the same way. I can either hit the stop button or hit connect. So he'll hit stop, robot stops moving. What I might wanna do here is you can see that as the robot becomes more complicated, it helps a lot in your coding if you give the motors more descriptive names. So it might not be so obvious what it is that motor one is controlling. So what I might do here instead is I was able to observe when I made this go on, but this was actually my left motor. So I've called it motor left to simplify the programming. My lucky guess is that motor six is the right side motor, but just because nobody wants to be fooled, let's hit connect. Oops. Might take a second here while I refresh. Sometimes if you have connection problems, you just have to open the program again. Uh, so let's try this again and see if this works. Could be that I'm unplugged. Some magic of live demos. And it looks like I think I was unplugged. So give me a second here while I... So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit connect. I'm going to play with that slider. And it's just going to take a second here while I check something out on my computer. So let's go and hit connect. Okay. Okay, so now we can go back to screen share. Ignore the man behind the curtain. Um, okay. So what I've done here is you can see that the sensors are grabbing information. See how it's turning from blue, green to violet. Uh, the, I have my motor six spinning and I'm using this slider to make it move forwards and backwards. And then I have my two bumpers 
and as I press them, you can see. And that all just came about from hitting connect and being plugged in. We also see that when the program's running, there's a little green bar that shows up here in the status window at the bottom. So what I'm gonna do is now that I can see that motor six is spinning, I might also wanna give it uh, a better name. So let's hit disconnect. I was able to see that that was my right side motor, so I'm gonna call this motor right. Um, now, this is an important uh, place to stop and show you something uh, that you would not be able to appreciate uh, if you didn't have the real robot. So in the process of building this robot, what is actually happening is we have, we have two, these are what the motors actually look like, right? So what we have here is we have the motor, we have the little uh, telephone cable jack that it would connect to the appropriate port. And then on the motor, there's a label, it says VEX. And there's a little diagram. And what the diagram is showing is it's showing the axis of rotation. And so what is actually happening, and we can't see it because the motors are really close, are pressed together uh, in the robot. So when we look at the robot, the motors are right beside each other. But what is happening is that one of the motors is actually upside down. And it's a common source of problems. People build the robot they start making it move and it's moving weird, right? One motor is going one direction, the other motor is going in reverse. And so we have to do something called reversing the polarity of the motor. And that's really just a fancy way of saying, um, we're gonna make the upside down motor behave in the opposite manner. So when the upside down motor is uh, programmed to go forwards, it's actually gonna spin backwards. When it's programmed to spin backwards, it's gonna go forwards. And that always makes my brain hurt trying to explain that. So I'm just gonna show you, but know that this step is related to the fact that when these motors are together, one of them is upside down. And so by out of the box, the robot's gonna move in a slightly strange way. The teacher's guide does talk about this. So if you're like, I'll never remember that, it's, it is in the book. Um, give me a second here to show you what that looks like. Um, so here we are in uh, back in our programming environment. What I might want to do here is I've stopped the program. Again, I could hit stop. It says stopped execution. Um, here, motor right, it turns out, is the upside down motor. So you might also see here that there's some gear icons. These gear icons allow us to configure uh, the various motors and sensors. So for motor right, I'm going to click on the little gear icon and if I had, say, changed the motor to a different, to a sensor or plugged something else in, this is where I would change it. I could also rename the motor up here. Most importantly is where it says subtype motor. We're going to change this to motor reverse polarity. And that's that whole step of making this motor behave in the opposite way that it's being instructed. So forwards will be reversed for this motor. Reverse will be forwards. Again, the software looks out, does that all for you. You don't need to know how that how that all works, it's just magic, we'll hit okay. The other thing we might wanna do here is there, because there's two, there's actually two ways of driving the robot. We can, we can control the individual motors, which is akin to going like left, right, left, right. So if you were walking, when we walk, we don't say left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. That takes a lot of mental effort to move like that and to think about movement in that fashion. Um, to make life easier, we can set up what is called a drive train. And the easiest way of thinking about what the drivetrain is, is it's kind of like the steering wheel on your car. It allows a single programming block to control multiple motors. So in the case of making this robot drive around, say on the floor of our classroom, it might be easier if I um, use a drivetrain block. So I'm just gonna show you how to use it. You do not have to use it. It just makes movement easier. And again, the book uh, addresses this point. So here I will, I've clicked on the little gear icon for the drivetrain. It says, do you want to enable it? Yes, I do. And this is where giving my motors useful names is going to pay dividends because it needs to know what is your left motor. Well, my left motor is the one that I said is my left motor. So see how nice that is? My right motor is going to be motor right. I've already reversed polarity. Uh, had I not done that step, it does it for you automatically. This box will be checked. The wheel travel and the track width you can also ignore. Um, we have mapped out, uh, the wheel travel is essentially the width of the wheels. Uh, VEX makes different wheel sizes because these robots are out of the box using the standard 200 millimeter width wheels. We've given that to you. The track width is the distance between the wheels. Um, again, we've figured that out for you, so you don't need to change that. 
where you would change this is if you had built a really large robot or a really small robot and you were trying to get greater precision and movement, you may find that you can achieve that by playing with the track width. But in your case, you can ignore these two boxes. And in most cases, this reverse polarity box will already be checked um, for you. So I'll hit OK. So now we're all set up. We have our motors, we have some extra sensors, and we have a drivetrain. On the left-hand side, we have our different blocks. And we can just step through these. The blocks, generally speaking, are organized by functionality. So all the blocks related to sensors we would expect to find in the sensor library. Um, all the blocks related to motors and movement we would expect to find in the motors library. Um, it, there will come a time when we're building a robot uh, that makes decisions. So it's using the sensor to make decisions from its environment. So all of the blocks related to looping and logical evaluation are found in the logic and loops library respectively. And the book does a pretty good job of going through all these. So I won't spend a lot of time in here. I just want to show you that most in most times, most cases, the, the block you're looking for lives in a library with related blocks. All um, Blockly programs start with a start block. You might notice that Blockly uses kind of a jigsaw uh, programming metaphor. So it uses snapping blocks. Um, for a program to run, the, this, the, the program will run from top to bottom until there's no more blocks left to execute. Blocks that are not joined to a start block are disabled. And so as we build, I'm just making this up, as we build our Blockly program, we just snap blocks. But all Blockly programs must have a start block. You might notice that there's nothing, there's no puzzle or jigsaw puzzle insert at the top of the start block. If for whatever reason you happen to be missing your start block or your kids have deleted it, you can find the start block here in the robot mesh library at the very top. It's the very first block in the very first library because it's the very first thing that needs to be done. Uh, so I'll take my left clicking here. I'm just going to drag this uh, to delete blocks. You've seen me hit the delete key. I can also drag blocks here into the little trash bin. It does the same thing. It just depends on how much clicking you want to do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write a very simple program. Uh, it's just going to make the robot uh, drive in a loop. So I'm going to have a start program. And the robot is going to use that drivetrain. So remember, I have a block now that will control both motors for me, so this simplifies things. So it's gonna drive forward or reverse, so forward. The power setting is between zero and 100. At zero, the motor's off. At 100, it's moving as fast as it can. Um, again, if you find you're not getting the exact type of movement you want, it might be worth to explore playing with the power setting. Also, the type of surface that the robot drives on um, also matters, right? So if you're driving the robot on a carpeted surface, it's going to behave differently than if you're driving it on a linoleum floor. Uh, so again, you may want to also experiment with driving the robot in different environments. But we have this power setting. I'll leave it at 100. And um, depending on how comfortable you are with the metric system, you can play around with this. Um, but 200 is probably a nice pl place to start. It's roughly 20 centimeters. Um, and then the robot's going to turn left. So it's going to drive forward. It's going to turn left. And say we want to do that four times to make the robot drive in a square. So here, under loops, we could repeat those blocks. You can see that I can insert the blocks above and then just take them, snap them in. So it's going to repeat four times. And actually, what was cool is I had talked earlier about how the Blockly generates uh, Python. If there's a generated code tab, and the program we just created created all of this. So if I wanted to see if I wanted to see this in real time, I can actually take this generated code tab and there's a little arrow here. It's like a dock or an anchor. And now what I, if I were to repeat those steps and say, oh, I want a program that loops four times and then drives forward for whatever distance we want it to drive forward. I'm just going to make up a number here. Again, might, maybe I need more screen real estate, so I just pull this back. And then the robot's going to turn. And then for fun, you know, uh, we're going to print a little message here to the bottom of the screen here that says uh, uh, robotics. Oops, robotics is awesome. Awesome. And so what we see here on the right hand side is actually generated all of that code. See that robotics is awesome and there's actually the Python for it. So later on, if you actually wanted to get into Python coding, you have a great place to do that. 
what I'm going to do now is I've written my program. It doesn't do very much. Um, maybe just because I want to get fancy and impress all of you. I will add a little um, sound. It's going to play when it's finished. It's going to go ta-da when it's done. And now let's run this program and actually try it out. So again, the steps are the same as when I was doing the controller mapping. I'm going to, you won't see this right now, but I'm taking the robot. I'm taking the micro USB cable. I'm plugging it into my computer. And what I'm going to do now is I have some choices. I can hit the play button and run this code. So I'll hit play to run. And it doesn't like something here because I've done something evil, which is interface not connector port. Make sure your interface. So again, what is likely happening here is we're just going to turn the robot off and on. It does sometimes happen that the robot um, times out. And I'm using a very loose wobbly cable, which is not that great. So the cable does come out. So let's come back to my motor movement program. We can see that it auto saved everything. So everything's waiting there for me. Let's try this again and hit play. So now it's downloading the code. We can see that here at the bottom. And it's running. So it types robotics is awesome. And then it's going to, let's see. So I'll do that again so that we can see it here, what the robot was doing. So let's run that one more time. OK. So then the, 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 code, the code ends down here at the bottom. Um, so what else we could do is I happened to have been tethered. So I had that robot tethered to my computer and I was holding it in front of the webcam. But we might very likely want the robot to run on the floor uh, without being tethered. So what I also could have done is I can go from this little pull down menu and just download my code. So I'll choose that option this time and hit download. It's going to do the same thing. I'm going to unplug the cable. And what we will not see um, here is it actually now on my brain, you can't see it. My monitor is too bright. It, there's an that program exists. So I'll use the directional arrows to uh, find my program and I'll just run it off the brain. Okay. So again, just to repeat that, because that's kind of the most important part. We have two options when when programming. We can run the we can run the the code on the tethered robot that's connected to the computer. Or if I wanted to now have the robot on the floor from the pull down menu, I choose download, and then just click the download button. And I'll use the directional arrows on the IQ brain um, to select that program. And this is why giving the program a good name uh, like motor movement is going to make it easy when I have multiple programs on the brain. The very last thing I will discuss is there is a description tab. We don't make so much use of it in this, but in the virtual robotics program that uses a simulated version of the uh, IQ robot, um, you'll find the teacher lesson actually in here. But students can use this pane to document their designs. You know, I think there's options here to insert a YouTube video and so on and so forth. Um, but it's really just like a student notebook. We don't do anything with it. I'm going to hang out here because I know that was a lot to digest. And the first time I heard this, my brain hurt from listening to the speech. Um, so I'm just going to end the screen share and we'll just stop here for questions because I know that that was a lot of information. Um, Vicki, is there anything here in the chat that you can see that I missed while I was running around? There is nothing that's coming up, but I would say give it a minute or two. Let um, okay. people want to ask a question. And if it's easier, um, again, in the, I think it's in the participants list, you can raise your hand. I'm the host of the meeting, so I can't raise my own hand. Um, but if you want to be unmuted, then stick your hand up and I will unmute you. You can ask your question that way. So Heather is asking where um, the recording of this will be. And yeah. Heather, that'll be sent to you um, in a couple of days. Uh, it takes a little bit for it to download, and then Chris will convert it for us and send it over. Yes. Unfortunately, it's a monster video file, so it, my computer has a stroke pulling down all the, the data. But um, it, it's very likely the videos will be ready on Monday. Uh, so I'll just send an email to Shirley, and I'll let her look after the distribution. Uh, I believe Catapult also has a uh, teacher resource page where these videos are likely to be hosted. Uh, so there, there'll be multiple places where the documentation lives. Um, any other questions that I've missed? 
Okay. I will um, show you uh, one other thing. Um, and that is, I guess my question for you is, are all of the participants in this class doing just physical robots or are some of you doing virtual robots as well? These are all in-person robots. All in-person? Okay. Okay, so I will not talk about the virtual robot thing then, that, pretend I didn't say anything. Uh, but there's there's an, a way to do this using a simulator, uh, which is uh, involves a slightly different version of this program. Um, the other thing I will show you is I talked briefly about how to um, uh, customize the controller setup. So let me show you that, and then I'll turn it over to Shirley. I know that she had some things she wanted to get through just with regards to the logistics of running the course, and I want to make sure I give her enough time uh, to do that. So I'm going to be very quick with this. Again, everything I showed you does live in the book. Um, so uh, let's just go here. So we're now back in Robot Mesh Studio. Again, um, if this was one, if this, I think there's a finished example program where we go through this exact exercise. I think it's called Square Dance. So let's just find it here. Uh, somewhere here it says Square Dance. Square Dance, RMS. So if you're like, oh, how would it work? Well, let's open up the solution set. And so what we see in this solution set is everything is locked down. I cannot delete or move anything. The other thing we see is that the sensors and motors are all locked down. So this solution set is predicated on you uh, having built the robot as you were instructed in the instructions. So if you've built it slightly differently, that's okay. It's just that the solution is not gonna run on your thing. And so here, what we can do is if I wanted to demonstrate the, the, the final program here, I could either connect the robot and run it or download the code. And we would get a program called Square Dance RMS um, on our IQ screen. There was one last uh, thing that I wanted to show you because the, the course uh, does get into it, is I'll create a new project. Again, it's gonna be a VEX IQ project. This time the language is going to be Controller Express. So we talked about you could program the controller um, and customize it. So let's do that. It gives me a cute name, Nimble Horse. I like uh, Custom Controller is a better name. So let's hit Create and see what this looks like. So again, we have our uh, same setup. This, the programming screen went away. What we have in its place is a picture of the, of the controller uh, and uh, buttons that will allow us to map uh, motor movement uh, to the different controller buttons. So what I want to show here, and it's going to be a little tricky to see, so let me go out of screen share for a moment, is I have on my controller, and you're going to see it, you can see there's little labels. And what it's telling you is that each of the joysticks, so the joystick has an up and down movement, right? This is movement along our Y axis. Uh, we have movement along the X axis. There's another label saying that there's another radio channel that's telling you that when you move the robot this way, it, it corresponds to that label. We have different buttons. We have the same joystick mappings for the other joystick. And then there's a pair of um, uh, top buttons that we can use. Where we typically would use this is if you build the robot that has uh, the claw and the grabber, right? So now you have a robot that has many motors then what you'll find is you're using these other buttons to control the robot arm and the grabber. Let's go back uh, into screen share and let's just see if I'm a victim of my own success here. I'm going to turn the robot on again and connect it to my programming environment. It's going to take a second. I have to just go through an exercise where I have to repair my controller. Fortunately, that was kind of a silly decision on my part to Okay, so my controller is now paired. Uh, you didn't see that, but all I did is I took the, the ethernet cable and connected the controller to the robot. So what we're gonna do now here is I'm gonna take my other micro USB cable, plug it from the computer into the robot brain, which again, you can't see so easily. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on that detect sensors button. So here we, we see that all. And in this particular case, I happen to know from the past exercise that the motor on port one was the left motor. So I'm just going to give it a better name so that I know what it is. And I knew that this is my right motor. We also remember that the uh, motor on port six is upside down in the, in the construction. So I'm going to change this to uh, reverse polarity. Again, I just got there from the little uh, gear icon. And so now let's map controllers. So we see on the left, hand side uh, of the controller, there's an A channel, which is going to control the joystick movement along the Y axis. 
So here we see axis A, Y. I'm going to add an action, and I'm going to choose linear control. You're almost always going to be choosing linear control. And then it's going to say, what am I controlling? Well, you're controlling your motor left along the Y axis. Uh, then we have a joystick on the other side, and that is our D channel. So here I'm going to find axis D, add action, linear control, and what motor am I controlling? I'm controlling the right motor. And so now you can imagine if I had other, other claws and arms and components to the robot, I could add that, map that functionality to the different uh, channels on the controller. But what I'll do now is I'll just uh, run the program so it's downloading it. The program's running because we have this green bar. Let's get out of the screen share and see if this works. So now what I have is I have my joystick. I have my robot. And when I press down on the joystick, it's going to be a little tricky. So as I press down on the left joystick, the left side of this robot's moving. On the right, motors uh, are controlled by the right joystick. So it's a way that you can customize the control setup. Again, the book gets into all of this detail. Uh, so there's lots of practice with this. I just wanted to show you the two different ways of programming. Um, I will show you the support. So the most important part here is where you can ask questions. Again, uh, despite the video being recorded, I know some of you will want to uh, have issues come up. And if you are experiencing technical uh, difficulties, I will give you uh, our 1-800 number and the support channel number so you can ask us for help. Um, I think it's the case here that you guys can see, uh, Vicky, the support contact information. Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, you'll just send an email to support at robotmesh.com. Be sure to let them know that you're a full bloom slash catapult robotics teacher. My reasoning for you telling them that is you're using a slightly different version of the software than what is publicly available. You're using a custom version of it for catapult. So um, whoever is taking your help request will, if he has that piece of information, he'll he'll be able to take you and direct you to the right place. We're in Seattle, so our hours of operation are 10 to 6.30 Pacific. So for you East Coast peace people, um, give us some time to get out of bed. That is everything I wanted to get through and more. I will uh, stop the screen share. I'll see if you have questions. I'll turn it over to Shirley for her to do her magic. Um, any other any questions? Like I said, I, I'm I'm sympathetic to your plight. I was once in your shoes and I had to listen to some guy drone on for two hours about robots, having never programmed one myself. And I'll just let um, Vicky MC here and say, is there anything in chat that I've missed? Um, so there was a question of, about how long it takes. And if you want to speak a little bit to how long a build actually takes, because I mm -hmm. think that's, um, I mean, I mm -hmm. I have my ideas about it, <laughs> having gone through the training before. Um, sure. Um, that's a very good question. And I am going to show you where you can find that information out. Um, from my own experience, to build the robot takes about 45 minutes. Um, I've been building the robot lots and lots of times, and I've probably gotten it down now to about 20 minutes. So I, I get a little faster each time. The very first time I built this robot, there was lots of profanity involved, and um, it probably took me closer to an hour. Um, but the good news is that once you build the robot, you do not need to deconstruct it and rebuild it. So once you build the robot, just set it aside and go through the rest of the course. There was a question in the last workshop, should I be deconstructing the robot and rebuilding it each time? And the answer is no. The first lesson is about just building the robot. Um, I'm just gonna find it here on the screen. Um, just, uh, just to show you in that instruction. So I think in, I'm using intermediate guide number seven. Let's just go back up here to the building instructions. So if we look at the, this is the teacher's lesson for session one in intermediate unit seven, where we're gonna build the robot. And at the top right corner of the, of the page, it says 45 to 60 minutes. So it takes about 45 minutes. Some will be faster, some will be slower. In fact, the lesson assumes that you may want to spend time in the first lesson just discussing the robot and getting kids to come up with their ideas about how it should behave. And so actually the robot build is scattered over two lessons. I believe in the first lesson, you build the driving base that I went through. 
And then in the second lesson, you add uh, sensors to it. And so in the building instructions, uh, which are here, whoops, let's go to here. So we, you will call that uh, in, in the first lesson, we've built the robot. There's no sensors, there's just two motors. We've stopped at step 19 and it's saying to continue finishing the robot to add all of the sensors to it, go to step 102. So I think it's somewhere here that we get into step 102. So this is step 102, autopilot instructions. And so what you're gonna do in this stage is you're gonna add a little bridge that will allow you to mount the various sensors. And again, it's telling you what ports to use. So this is the color sensor, it's going into port three. You have a gyroscopic sensor, it's going into port number four. It's telling you the cable length to use. This is a 300 millimeter wire. And you go along and so on and so forth until eventually you have a robot that has uh, four front sensors and two bumper sensors. Um, but again, to the adding of these sensors, I think this part is probably 15 minutes and building the base is 45. And the lessons themselves are roughly scheduled to take about an hour each. But um, if you need more time, you need more time. Uh, and that's okay. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, other questions before I let Shirley become our presenter? And again, if you think you want to ask a question, just stick your hand up and I'll unmute you. And someone asked in the chat, Chris, um, what was the address for the site that showed the different styles of robots that can be Sure. Done? Yeah, yeah, the, eas the um, easiest way to get there, of course, is Google is your friend. But um, what we'll do here is I'll just go through the exercise of here I'm in Google. And what I've typed in is the robot you're using is called a VEX IQ. And then I just type VEX IQ build instructions. The very first link is from vexrobotics.com, IQ build instructions. And so what we would find here is if I was like, oh, this alligator looks interesting, I would like to build it, then I'll click on the build instructions and it will pull up the PDF. Um, and you'll see that it's exactly the same, you know, building it is exactly the same as the other robot, it's just gonna look different. So I've, I've used those extra um, lessons for some of, if I have kids that have really flown through the material and, and wanna try new things, I just have this as an activity to keep um, some of the more advanced students hop, hopping. Um, but uh, the lesson material uh, only uses those first two builds. Uh, so you don't need to worry about this unless you want to build other things. Um, any other questions before I turn things over to Shirley? No, silence. That means you guys all get this and you're ready to teach it. <laughs> okay. Well, again, um, we're happy to help. So if you do run into problems, support at robotmesh.com uh, or the 1-800 number. Uh, again, all that doc that will live in the documentation and uh, we'll help you get on your way. We've now been running this program for a couple of years, so at least two years, and it's been pretty slick. Uh, so I, the first year I was expecting lots of nervous and angry teachers to be yelling at me and finding me, and it never happened, I'm still here, um, which means we must have done an awesome job and it totally all works, um, but I'll let you guys be the judge of that. Um, I'm gonna make Shirley the presenter, uh, and she has some things I think she wants to get through to you. Uh, so let's make, make, make Shirley. Shirley, you are now our fearless leader. Thank you, Chris. Great. So I'm just going to share, I, and you know, I know it's a Friday afternoon and folks probably don't want to be in a training. Um, we totally get that. So I will try to get through this as quickly as possible. Some of this information will echo some of what um, both Chris and Vicki have shared with you all. But this is really an opportunity for you all to get to see what the framework is. And we'll talk a little bit also about our BeBots program, which is our robotics program for you know our early learners. And so for folks who had some questions about that in the chat, we will get to that. And so just very quickly, you know, if you facilitated any of our STEM, STEAM, or even our robotics programs previously, you know that the engineering design process is really the grounding um, and the framework that informs the approaches that we use. And so, you know, we've designed this robotics program um, to really help students cultivate 21st century skills that they need to succeed, not only in the classroom, but in the real world. So there's a lot of problem. I mean, robotics within itself is about problem solving, critical thinking, 
but you know we've also built in these key pieces around um, creativity and collaboration cooperation making sure that students have an opportunity to really work together to come to solutions and as you will see momentarily the engineering design process really teaches them the discrete steps of the prob the problem solving um, process so that well, no matter what context they're in, no matter what classroom they're in or what problem they encounter anywhere, they're able to say, here are some steps that I can, you know, I can apply to solve the problem, right? That the engineering design process works in any situation. Um, so part of this is really teaching our students how to be able to transfer those skills across new contexts. And so Chris spent a lot of time talking about um, what what comes in the kits um, and things like that. So I won't go too much in depth about those things, but you know, I, I think that one of the really important pieces about our program is that you know we're cultivating a growth mindset not only for our students but also for our teachers, right? And so a lot of I think that traditionally as educators we've been taught to exist in this performance zone where we feel like we're always being watched, we're always being evaluated. And in a lot of ways, our students kind of take that on and that's where they exist because they're used to being in situations where they're constantly being graded, they're constantly being observed. And so they're always really anxious about you know, performance. However, we really wanna kind of shift that mindset into getting our teachers, um, but also our students to understand that, you know, existing in the learning zone is really important. It's, it's low stakes but this is an opportunity for them to really practice these skills and get really good at them and master some of the content. And so, you know, we really encourage them to make mistakes and work through those mistakes, right? Like making mistakes, failing, it's not the end of the world. It actually makes you a better student. It makes you a better learner if you're able to identify your mistakes and work backwards to fix, to fix them. So we really encourage as much as possible um, our students to really be in the space of learning. Um, and for you as the teacher, as the facilitator to really support that by asking them questions and by using inquiry-based approaches to kind of guide them, you know, questioning techniques and things like that, rather than just telling them how to do things. And, you know, I, I think that with the robotics program, there's, you know, the balance of that is that a lot of teachers don't have previous experience with robotics or, with coding and engineering. And so there's an opportunity really to kind of take a step back and be a moderator in the classroom as opposed to the sage on the stage who's telling kids how to do things and giving them the right answers. Because really there isn't necessarily one specific way to do things um, in this program. And so often you will find that your students are more comfortable with these tools, with these digital tools than you are. And that's totally fine. We don't expect you to know everything and to teach them everything. And in many cases, many instances, they will be the one who, they will be the ones who are telling you how to kind of navigate and use these, these tools and these kits. And that's totally fine. So hopefully me saying all of that takes the pressure off of you a little bit. And the reason why we've also structured our program this way is because students really have a chance to hone these habits of mind. Again, you know, I talked about things like resiliency already and creativity thinking flexibly, but also some really cool skills like just finding humor and error, right? Making friends, taking responsibility for your actions and being able to build empathy, all things that we, and we in some cases take for granted. These are skills that we can teach our students and the earlier we start, the better off they are. Um, and so our programs are also aligned to some of the standards that you all are used to, like um, the 21st century skills, as I mentioned, the next generation stand science standards, which is the NGSS, um, the information um, and technology standards, national state standards, and all of the problems that they're going to encounter are really connected to authentic real world experiences. And so these are things that, you know, they can really take with them and, and use in any context. And I mentioned using inquiry-based approaches earlier um, to really support your students. And so inquiry involves tackling real world questions and issues and controversies, helping your students to develop questioning and research as well as communication skills. And so again, rather than telling them how to do things, prompting them to think about certain things and using 
reflective um, thinking and reflective questioning to guide them to come to solutions is really important. So they're going to use, um, they're going to come up with a hypothesis and test them through collaborative work. And overall, they're going to develop a deep understanding of the content knowledge while also becoming confident and independent learners. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with the engineering design process that I keep talking about, this is essentially what it looks like. You know, it has six steps that take students through this iterative cycle where they define a problem. And once they've identified what that problem is, they will do some research to come up with potential solutions and then brainstorm ideas either individually in pairs or in small groups. Based on their brainstorming, they'll choose some solutions and build prototypes or models that suit that solution. They'll then test that solution to make sure it works or actually solves the problem at hand. If it doesn't work, they know that they can go through the cycle again and start over to come up with a different solution. If it does work, they have an opportunity to make the model even better, right? So, you know, in the case of a robot, they may sit back with their friends and think about what else can we add to this robot to make it do its job even better, right? Or how can we redesign it so that it moves slower, or quicker, or whatever the problem is that they're trying to solve. So this is the engineering design process. And again, all of these resources that you're seeing will come with the teacher lesson manual and the student resource books. We also have posters. And so all of these visuals will be represented in the materials that you receive if you haven't received them already. And so Chris went through most of these slides, so I won't take too much time going through them, but I do want to take a little bit time, a little bit of time differentiating between the different levels here. And so I'll start with elementary and intermediate because that's what we've been talking about. That's what the robotics program is at Catapult, whether you're doing in person or virtual, that's the robot mesh program. And so if you're teaching elementary level, which is grades three to five, you're doing these five units um, in the introduction to robotics and coding, um, getting to know your robot, sensors, sumo tournament, and high rise challenge. And so someone had asked in the chat, you know, I want to make sure that my students get to actually build their robots and see a final product. Your, your students are going to get to see a final product within the first couple of sessions of the program. Um, but what happens in subsequent units is that they're going to add modifications and adaptations and add the different sensors and you know other parts so that the robots are able to perform certain tasks. Um, and then ultimately, they're going to engage in some sort of, of a competition, whether it's the sumo, tur sumo tournament or a basketball tournament or something else. In intermediate grades, which is grade six and above, um, again, similarly, you'll see that units six um, through eight are similar topics, but they're a little bit more advanced in content because those students are older. And then in units nine and 10, they're dealing with color and line following. So here, students are going to be programming their robots to be able to follow um, certain lines and to compete with other robots. And then they're going to do the sumo tournament in unit 10. I'm going to pause here and answer a couple of questions in the chat. And if you have, if folks have additional questions, please feel free to either ask them now or ask them later. Um, so someone asked at St. Teresa, we have a four week program. Can we get through all five lessons in four weeks? Um, you, you may and you may not get to, and that's fine. I mean, I think that one of the really great things about our program is your, your students really help you to dictate the pace of the program. And so if you're seeing that, even though the sessions are structured for about 45 to 60 minutes, um, but maybe it's taking your students an hour and a half instead of the 60 minutes to get through one lesson, that's totally fine. I, I think that you want to move at their pace so that they're getting the most out of it. So it may be that you get to unit nine instead of unit 10, and that's totally fine. Um, I think in some places, this is where I think you may have to use your judgment a little bit. Um, in some places, lessons build on, on top of each other, and in some activities, they don't. And so I think as you're planning for your sessions, you'll get to see where maybe things need to happen in um, sequential order or where and where you have an opportunity to maybe hop around a little bit. Um, but either way, it's okay, right? If you don't get to it, 
down the line, they'll probably take a similar program or, or they'll do something with this program again or something similar to it, and they'll be able to learn those skills. And so I think you really want to give your, your students an opportunity to explore and get comfortable with this content. And if that means that they won't get through every single thing, that's totally fine. Thank you for that question, Norman. I'm just checking to see if there are other questions. Not yet. Okay. And so that's elementary and intermediate. So remember, if you're teaching grades three and up, you're running the robot mesh program, um, also known as our robotics program. If you're facilitating sessions for robotic sessions for the primary grades, typically grades in kindergarten through second grade, you'll be using a program called um, BBOTS. And BBOTS are being shipped you know, separately. And so that's a completely different conversation. Um, while the framework in terms of the engineering design process and the approach that we use for that program is the exact same as what we're talking about in this robot mesh session, um, you know, the product, the actual thing that the students are programming is different. In that case, they will be programming a B to run different tasks um, based on what themes are being covered in that unit. And so the reason why we don't take, you know, we don't need a very in-depth training like this one for the BBOTS is, is because that program is very um, intuitive. Um, you literally charge, charge it um, with the USB cable or you put a, a couple of batteries in it and you're able to use arrows. Um, it's really very much designed and is very age appropriate for you know, students who are in kindergarten to about second grade. And so it's very intuitive. You know, the buttons on there are very self-explanatory. Students aren't having to build anything from scratch. They literally are just programming it. And so that robot mesh or that BBOT program um, is a little, or much easier actually, much easier to use than robot mesh, which is, you know, because our students in elementary and intermediate are older and are expected to have different competencies, they're actually building the robots from scratch. And so that's, that's the key difference there. Um, but as always, if you have questions about any one of these levels or any one of these programs, you can always reach out to me or to Vicki um, and we can take it from there. And I wanted you all to have an opportunity to also see what the printed materials look like. And so in any case, no matter what grade level you're using, you're going to receive a teacher lesson manual, um, a student resource book, some posters, et cetera. And all of our teacher lesson manuals look like this, that this is what the cover page looks like. Um, so it'll have the unit number and the grade level or the, the grade band at the bottom right. Um, and it'll have the title of the unit um, and the big circle at the top left, which you know, I just kind of walk through. And the structure of each of the pages is pretty much the same. Um, each unit will begin with a breakdown, a table of contents that shows you the title of the unit as well as um, how many sessions are in that lesson. So each, um, each lesson is comprised of um, two or more sessions. So each session is usually about 45 to 60 minutes, but if you need more time than that, that's totally fine. So the title of each of those sessions are there and you know you get a sense of what students are going to be working on immediately just by looking at the table of contents. At the beginning of each unit, we also have the essential questions and the objectives that um, are, hall are hallmarks of each of the units. You'll also see what types of assessments are included for students and so you know, in session one, which is begin your robot. This is where students begin to describe what a robot is and they begin to understand the different pieces that they're going to use to build the robot. And then they follow the instructions to begin building the robot using um, the posters that Chris has talked about and, you know, the other resources that come in the kit. And on page three, you'll see that, you know, on the left hand, in the left column, you know, you know that for formative assessments, students are being asked certain questions about robots um, as they assemble them, whereas the summative assessments really are just opportunities for you to ask students some questions and listen to how they respond um, so that you can determine whether they've mastered the content or not. And so there's that sort of a distribution of um, assessments throughout the program. 
Um, we also provide a background for each of the units so that you as the teacher aren't having to do any extra work, any extra groundwork to prepare for the session. All of what you need is right here in the teacher lesson manual for you. We provide some tools and tips for differentiating, for organizing your students, groups, and things like that. Um, all of that is here. And if you're interested in standards, we also include some content on which standards we're aligning each of the sessions or each of the lessons to. So you'll, you'll see here each lesson starts out with an objective or with a set of objectives. There's a list of materials that are needed. All of these materials come with the kit. And so the expectation is that you're not having to purchase anything else because everything you need is right here. Um, so you just read through it and determine what you need. Literally everything that you need is right here for you. We also include little um, screen captures of the posters so that you know where on the posters to look. Um, and also which corresponding pages in the student resource books um, that students need to look at as they are working. So that structure is pretty much the same. Um, this is what the student resource book cover looks like. Again, they have some pages here where they can reflect. And then we have posters throughout the program, how to be a, part a respectful particip participant, ways of thinking, these are the habits of mind engineering design process and such, and then, you know, some pre and post tests. So that's, that's essentially it. That's the framework of the program, whether you're teaching um, grades one to two or grades three and above. And, you know, here are some images of how the boxes typically will arrive to you. I know Chris covered this in the beginning, but, you know, we ask that you don't throw anything away because at the end of your program, we're going to have to send these boxes back to Robot Mesh to um, just make sure that you know they're ready for the next group to use. And so, as much as possible, encourage students not to take things out of the classroom, not to take pieces, and you know to keep things in one place to you know help us out when we are um, at the end of the uh, this program and are prepping for our next round of things. So, any questions? So Shirley, I know there, and I can't remember if it was privately messaged to me or not earlier, um, some of our teachers in South Carolina have not received their teacher lesson manuals. Um, so I did reach out to one of their field operators. Um, they are coming, so don't fear, they are on their way. But there is a workaround for those of you um, who might not have them yet, and that is to go into through the Summer Journey app via your Okta dashboard and then you can access that there. And if it is helpful for me to share that or show that, um, Shirley, you wanna give me access to do a screen share, I can do that. Yeah, I just made you a host, Vicky. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. All right. So I just share my screen real quick. So just a real quick, if you get into your summer journey app from your Opta dashboard. It's under enrichment because it's part of our enrichment programs. Pick your grade level, and then it's this robotics image right here. See how we have the two? There's the robot mesh. That's all the virtual robotics programs. This is the robotics for in-person, also using the robot mesh studio. And then all of the units are here with your teacher lesson manual. Just haven't seen it. It does download into a new um, to a new file. And you share um, and then the there's that teacher lesson manual right there for you um, including um, all of the student resource book pages are there and then all of the posters are there for you so um, just in case 
you don't have them on your first day or you are, are looking for them uh, ahead of time, they are there for you. I know some of you are still struggling to get into Okta, so I do know that your, uh, your field team is working diligently to get you in there. And I will turn things back over to Shirley. So someone said they're still not able to access Okta. Um, yeah, that happens sometimes. You might have to reach out to IT if that persists. Um, what is the optimum group size to build the robots? Um, Chris responded to this. Um, it's two to three students per robot. Um, and that's typically what we advise as well. Um, you all as teachers or as facilitators don't necessarily have to worry about having to order all of these materials. They've been ordered for you and they were ordered with, with our guidance and our guidance said each hit, so each robot and each Chromebook um, is sufficient for two to three students. So that that's really, that's really an ideal situation. And obviously I think with everything going on with COVID and stuff like that, we've included sanitizers and what Clorox wipes and things like that so that students can clean up after themselves and disinfect as much as possible. I hope that helps a bit. Other questions, please? There's a question about a guide for robots we are using with younger students that presumably refers to the bots. Yeah, so so I, I think I mentioned that um, you'll be receiving, if you haven't already, the BBOT programs also come with their own teacher lesson manuals and student resource books that, you know, it's the exact same structure as what I just walked through. Um, the reason why we don't need a session like this for BBOTs is because students don't have to build their robots from scratch. They're just programming it. So as a teacher, you can literally read the teacher lesson manual and you know, be good, um, you know, be prepared to, to, to be able to teach your students that content. Other thoughts? Have fun with it. Um, I've, I've been doing this for about 10 years and I'm still the dumbest kid in my class. Um, my students are always have better ideas than me. Keep in mind that um, although there is a solution or an answer key with solution sets, there are multiple ways to program the robot. So even in our small little office, there's about five of us, uh, we each came up with different ways you could do it. Um, so the solution is not uh, the final answer. There are other ways you can do it. And um, you're, let, just let your kids explore. If your your real job is to be a facilitator and uh, and to show your kids where you can where they can find help and find resources. Uh, the book does a really thorough job of going through everything and great pains were taken um, uh, to ensure accuracy that all the programs work. Um, I helped work with the uh, Trillium publishers on the book. So uh, most of the lessons come from my own hard won experience with failing and having bad things happen to me and people booing me. Um, but none of those things will happen to you. Uh, it, it, I, I now really enjoy this program because I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Just let your kids run with it. Um, any other questions before we break for today? Okay, uh, I am finished. Uh, Shirley, Vicky, final parting words. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree 100%. I think just have fun with it. It's your students are going to know more than you. That's totally fine. And I think if you remember that your role is really to be a moderator or a facilitator rather than, you know, a traditional teacher who knows everything and expects your students to give you a specific answer to a specific problem. Um, as long as you can kind of shift your mindset around that, you'll be okay. I think you want to remember that there are going to be a million different ways and maybe not a million, but there are going to be at least two or three different ways at, at minimum. Um, ways to do things. And so your students are creative and crafty enough to figure those ways out. And so that's okay. And really give them an opportunity to, to do that and to 
you know, to help each other and to collaborate with each other and, you know, and to teach you some things too. And I think, you know, once you kind of adopt that mindset, you know, the pressure is much, much less and you're able to have fun with the program as well. So. Yeah, I will just echo Shirley's sentiments there. Enjoy it. It's summertime. It's robots. They're kids. It's all good. <laughs> Should be fun. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. As I mentioned, the session is recorded. It will take a day or two for it to get posted, and Shirley will be in communication with you to distribute those links. Um, again, just by way of sharing my screen for the support information, if you haven't already gotten it, I will uh, reclaim my hosting privileges somehow. Um, but, um, oh, reclaim host. Look, there's a button that does that for me. Okay, now I'm in charge. So again, if you if you need help, um, the I will just put the contact details on screen one last time uh, so you can see it. We are just support at robotmesh.com for technical support only. If, if the questions related to the logistics of your kits should really go to Catapult, we coordinate with the um, uh, Catapult sales department to make sure that all of the materials come at the right time for you. So these are just for questions related to programming or you know, if the robot's behaving oddly. Again, support at robotmesh.com. Phone number is 800-839-9205. And we are in Seattle. So uh, we're open 10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific, Monday to Friday. Remember to tell uh, us that you're a full bloom or catapult robotics teacher and that you're teaching with the physical kits. Uh, there are two flavors of this program, one that's completely using a simulated robot and one that's using the real robot uh, that we just discussed and the programming is a little bit different for both uh that i'll just leave that on screen and uh i wish you all uh, the best uh, the sessions over if you if you do have questions you want to ask but we're too shy to mention you can i'll hang out in the room for another minute or two um, otherwise uh, i wish you the best of luck this summer <laughs>